Hello, everyone. Good evening and welcome to a new edition of the Indian Express Explained Live, a series of online explanatory conversations with domain experts and authorities. I am Monojit Majumdar. And if you're on, how is it going to impact you is perhaps as important as the news itself. This evening, we are talking about India's new education policy. A year ago, the government announced the most comprehensive change since 1986 in the way we teach in our schools and colleges. The government presented its reasons and put forth its vision. Now, a year later, as the worst of the COVID-19 pandemic is hopefully over and educational institutions have begun to reopen for in-person classes, it is time to see the NAP in action. So what is changing and how? How prepared are institutions, students, and teachers for the changes? How will the changes impact you and me as individual students and parents? To answer these questions, and I'm sure many more, is the person who played a key role in the formulation of the NAP, Secretary to the Government of India and the Ministry of Education, Sri Amit Khare. Welcome to the Indian Express, sir. We are grateful for your time, and we are honored to host you. Speaking to Mr. Khare will be my colleague, Ritika Chopra, who covers education for the Indian Express and has been reporting on the NEP over the past year. Some of you might recall that Ritika and Mr. Khare spoke earlier and explained last year when the NEP was announced. Today's event will be a follow-up and an addition to what Mr. Khare had said on that occasion. We will also take a few questions from the audience. Today's explained event is brought to you by our partners, associate partners, Plutus IES and APJ Education. My thanks to our partners. And thank you all for joining and welcome once again. Ritika. Great. Thank you so much, Monajit. Uh, thank you, sir, for joining us. Uh, as Monajit mentioned, we had you for this event a year ago when the policy was launched. If I'm not wrong, this was around the first week of August, right after the policy launch. And at that time, you took us through the different aspects of the policy, uh, what implications, uh, different provisions of the policy has for the education landscape. Um, what we're going to focus on today is to care, basically focus on implementation. It's been a year since this document was launched. And uh, I think the, the viewers and listeners today would be keen to understand how has that one year, the first year of implementation of new education policy been? Uh, what has been achieved, although it's still very early into the implementation stage, but what has been achieved in the last one year, what are the teething issues that the government has faced, given that this is the first policy in three decades, and uh, what would be the priorities of the government for the next one year. Uh, thank you for joining us, sir. And I know that uh, you're with us uh, for about an hour or so, so I will jump right into it. And uh, I'll start with my first question. If you could, for the benefit of our audience here today, uh, give us an overview of how is it, or rather what's happening behind the scenes. How is it that the government is trying to implement this policy document? What infrastructure or systems have been put in place to ensure that the document is being implemented holistically and not in a piecemeal manner? Over to you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Ritika. Thank you, Monojit. I must thank uh, Indian Express for organizing this event. It does give us an opportunity to explain the government and our point of view. It also helps us to understand what are the critical issues at the back of the mind of uh, your readers, the viewers today. And these interactions are always very helpful. I'm thankful that last year we had met just after the launch of the National Education Policy on 29 July it was launched and we met in the first week of August. As Mr. Monojit said, last year was a difficult year with the pandemic, the first wave, then the second wave. But it does give us a very good insight into how the changes are to be managed in spite of these difficult times. Now, these difficulties, these challenges were converted into an opportunity by the 
Team India, I won't say only the government of India or the government of any state or the universities, Team India as a whole translated into an opportunity, the biggest change being the use of technology in education. In fact, if I list out, say, five major activities or items of the NEP 2020, which we have been able to implement in the last one year. The first and foremost will be the use of technology. In spite of the pandemic, we did not lose any education here. The entrance exams to various higher educational institutions, the joint entrance exam for the IITs and NITs, the need for the medical colleges, everything was held, even the university final year exams were held in the online mode or in the open book mode. A new system of assessment was developed. The online system of teaching and learning that was brought forward. And I'm glad to say that the major semesters of even the IITs could proceed on the online basis. Of course, many changes were made to shift the practicals to the next semester and to bring forward the theoretical part to the early semesters. But with all those tweaking, we have been able to manage the teaching learning to a very large extent through the online mode. If you take the higher education sector, other than online education, the second major achievement of the last year has been the launch of the Academic Bank of Credit. I mean, it's a, it's a path-breaking, it's a transformative change that the credits which are earned by the students will be kept in a separate digi locker. The architecture is already there. The backup is also there. And it will help students to move ahead even take a sabbatical, drop out for a year, come back to the system. So the new system of multiple entry and exit, and I'll come to each one of them. That is the third, the first being the online, second being the academic bank of credit. The third is the multiple entry and exit system, which has been adopted by many universities. The fourth is the multidisciplinarity, which is coming in many universities. In fact, that is something which our students will like to take benefit of. And the fifth is the use of Indian languages. I'm not talking about any particular language. These are all Indian languages. Many a times, English was considered to be the language through which teaching and learning could take place in the higher educational system. But now, we are promoting the use of Indian languages, not for the sake of Indian languages, but to ensure, and I think this is something which I like to emphasize, to ensure that the talented people who study in government school in their own regional languages, they are not deprived at the higher education level. So each one of them is very important. The learning that we had through the online education, the academic bank of credit, the multiple entry and exit system, the use of Indian languages, and the multidisciplinarity universities. If we, although I don't deal with the school education nowadays, but if I give a perspective, the launch of the integrated system of education from three years to 12 years, that is, uh, 3 to 18, if I could say, 5 plus 3 plus 3 plus 4, where the early childhood education has also been integrated. The assessment systems are undergoing a major change. So instead of having a one exam to determine the child's future, now the assessment systems are changing. Nipun Bharat, which focuses on the uh, numeracy and literacy skills that has uh, started. So all these initiatives within a span of one year have brought about a major change and the disruptions which were caused by the pandemic have been uh, tackled very efficiently by the use of technology. 
So you have you have given us a quick recap of of what has been done in the last one year. If you can, um, as I'd asked in the first question, if you can tell us what what are the systems that the government, what's happening behind the scenes? I mean, of course, a lot of these initiatives have been implemented by the union government, but a large part of it lies within the remit of the state. So what are the systems, what's the infrastructure that the government or the union government's put in place to ensure that the policy is implemented holistically by at, at your level, at the, at the level of the union government, as well as at the level of the states? No, uh, what I mentioned was both for the states as well as the central government. In fact, many of the state governments have already started the implementation of the various provisions of NEP in their own universities and their schools and uh, the skill development centers because this policy does not distinguish between various forms of education. It is a continuum. And it, in fact, focuses on a lifelong learning. So it is not so much focused on teaching, rather it is focused on learning. And many of the state governments have already in some form or the other come forward to implement it. One important aspect which has been and which is in the pipeline is the National Education Technology Forum. A task force under Mr. Shibulal has already been constituted. He is, because now, the future is going to be technology. Of course, technology will not replace the teachers, the importance of teachers and teaching learning, the personal interactions that we have in the classrooms or in the playgrounds. That will continue to have its importance. But given the uh, large population, given the uh, size of the cohort, the age group in which we have to impart education, and given the fact that many new learnings have to come even while we are working. So earlier concepts that we earn a degree and then go out for work is also changing many times the new skills or new knowledge has to be learned over the years. And all that will come through technology. The technology forum is trying to bring that synergy between various platforms of school, higher education, skill development, and other ministries, and also the state governments. In fact, uh, with my old association with the schools, I can say that much of the content which is developed on various platforms of uh, Diksha is actually contributed by the teachers of various state governments. So state government teachers, central government, we have to look at education as one holistic thing rather than looking in terms of the regulatory structures, whether it is the state government or central government or private or aided, unaided, various forms, they are forms of governance. The education as such will remain the same. The second important work which is in progress is, of course, the Higher Education Commission of India, which will bring a new regulatory structure Instead of having multiple regulators, there will be a single regulator. And the focus will be more on self-regulation rather than inspection and uh, you know, enforcement from the central or the state government. It will be more disclosure-based and a transparent system. But of course, this requiring parliamentary approvals will take a little time, but this is also in the process. So you mentioned, and, and that's correct, I mean, education, we have to look at look at it holistically, but, but on ground, uh, there are various implementing agencies. Of course, it, it won't be just one agency that would be implementing it. Um, is there some sort of coordination mechanism that the union government has with the states to ensure that implementation is smooth? And, and how is it that the center tries to keep track of, of uh, where does maybe each state stand in terms of implementing different aspects of it? I mean, have, have you all given them a list of priorities that they maybe should do in the first five years? There is one difference uh, which, uh, which is from other implementing uh, agencies or the policies or say the infrastructure that we cannot have one size fit all approach for a field like education because of the diversity involved in the entire country, there'll be 
different sub models while the policy remains the same for the entire country you know the way it is implemented will also depend on the local conditions and that freedom has to be given to the states we cannot say that all large universities will be bifurcated or trifurcated immediately or all autonomous colleges will get converted into universities different states have their different priorities and also uh, sensitivities because uh, education is a matter which is also dependent on the local culture and languages so we have tried to build a consensus on the policy the implementation these as far as schools are concerned it is almost entirely through the state governments and uh, it has been taken up by uh, various meetings of the official at the official level at the higher education level ugc is the prime regulator and they are regulator not only for central institution but they are also regulator for the state institutions and the private institutions so many forward looking policies and regulations have been brought by ugc which are helping in the implementation side uh, so there are of course two states karnataka and that was immediately followed by madhya pradesh where they had these announcements that they are the first states to implement this policy karnataka even had a grand event for it and which was attended by the education minister uh, but immediately after the announcement what we saw was that uh, there were reports uh, that in karnataka itself after the announcement universities were in the midst of the admission season and that universities were still waiting for clarity from the state government on how they should introduce multidisciplinarity in the sense that what are the combination of subjects they should offer and which is why there was confusion that happened while i understand that this doesn't have anything directly to do with the union government but is there anything i mean you mentioned that it's a learning process is there anything any mechanism that could be put in place that uh, that the focus should be on proper implementation as opposed to uh, big announcements like this state they you know it was launched with much fanfare but you know immediately after there were hitches and glitches and and that of course does sour that whole experience so is there anything that the state government sorry the central government can do to ensure that the implementation is as smooth as possible any kind of guidelines that you send across to the implementation agencies or states in this matter mm-hmm. even when the policy was launched last year we had clearly mentioned that it is transformative in nature but the implementation will be gradual so that there is no disruption in fact uh, the whole issue of four year course versus three year course so we did not change immediately universities including delhi university they debated they have they will be implementing it in a phase wise manner that some courses will shift to four years others who wish to go for job market will continue to be in 3 years so for a large system like us and a diverse system i mean uh, you are well aware that there are more than 3.85 crore students who are in the higher education alone and then there are nearly uh, another 30 crores who are either in schools or in the skill development side so immediate uh, uh, changes or disruptive changes are not Uh, to be encouraged what we do is to go in a uh, calibrated manner shift some of the ioes first if the academic bank of credit because different universities have different credit so it is not that everybody will shift together to a new system so it will have to be done over a period of time and that selection in the higher education we have done it on the basis of accreditation that those who are a plus they have been given the full autonomy to have any online course so roughly 200 odd universities can offer full online courses not that all 1043 universities will start offering because that will become a little difficult there are differing uh, standards amongst the institutions so one has to go in a manner which is uh, calibrated it cannot be very slow but ultimately based on some objective criteria and that objective criteria we have taken to be the accreditation of the institution and that is how we have proceeded 
Right. So I have one more question about the states, given that we are getting a lot of questions from the audience right now, also about the role of states in implementation. How is it, I mean, while, like I gave the example of Karnataka and Madhya Pradesh, which have been quite enthusiastic about implementing it, there are a few states which have also expressed reservation about the policy, about its implementation. And Tamil Nadu is amongst them, which, I mean, Tamil Nadu is one state which has even made the announcement that we will not implement the policy. In fact, we will devise something of our own and implement that. What What is it that the union government is trying to do? Is, is there any, uh, are you all trying to reach out to Tamil Nadu or states like Tamil Nadu, which may have reservations about the policy to ensure that they are also on board? The last meeting that we had, in uh, in the meeting which was held immediately after the policy was announced, of course that was before the assembly elections in Tamil Nadu, uh, all the uh, state governments had in fact uh, given their consent for the policy, of course with some local requirements. So overall the policy and uh, uh, no state has uh, as yet gone for a new policy of its own. So by and large, it is the same policy, some tweaking, as I said, at the local level, given their requirement of the state, they can have. But as I mentioned that the policy is one which empowers the students. It is student-centric. And I don't think any state, any institution will say, don't empower the students. They, I mean, if we are saying multiple entry and multiple exit, all States, all universities, all IITs cannot do it immediately. But the fact remains that this system is going to empower the students. So they will have to do it in phases. That phasing has to be done by the states or by the institution, even in the central institutions. I mean, we cannot compare one university with another. There are universities which are more than 100 years old. There are universities which have been recently set up with uh, very few students. There are universities with constituent colleges. So all of them, I mean, given this diversity, they will take their time to implement. So would have you all reached out to kind of address their reservations or clarify any doubts that they have about the policy? Yes, I mean, given that, they've, given that they've made a public announcement about it? The earlier, uh, I mean, uh, uh, we did have a meeting uh, of the ministers when the school examinations were to be decided. And at that time also they had reservations. The then minister, of course, this is uh, uh, the month of July. Yeah. And uh, the then minister had spoken to them uh, earlier. Okay. In fact, uh -huh. recently also their delegation had met the Honorable Minister. So he has been meeting the uh, ministers of different states or the chief ministers of different states. Right. Uh, so I'll come to the pandemic-induced disruption in school education now. Uh, to begin with, I would want to understand what, how has the pandemic, aside from the fact that, you know, and I would come to that later, the impact on uh, uh, learning, learning levels, uh, how has the pandemic impacted the implementation of this policy? What is it that the government, what are the learnings and how would you tweak um, your plans for implementation further, given that the pandemic sort of not going away? You know, it's, it's going to be around, we possibly have more waves. How would you try and implement this or would you, would the government rather prefer to hit the pause button and, and maybe ensure that we undo the damage done by the uh, school lockdowns and then maybe introduce because the policy in itself, uh, some of the changes, I mean, I'm using the word disrupt for the want of a better word, but some of the changes could be disruptive. And given that the sector is already undergoing a lot of disruption because of the pandemic. Uh, yeah, sorry, go ahead. So some of the disruptions which are caused by the pandemic are also the disruptions which are mentioned in the policy. In the sense, they are the transformative changes in, say, assessment. School assessments are undergoing a major change. Earlier system of having one examination and that deciding the entire career or future of a child 
is changing. It's changing all over the world. The policy has made major recommendation for change in the assessment at the school level also to have a 360 holistic report card. So that the assessment is more to find out the talent in any student rather than to rate a student compared to others. Now, the present system that we have, everybody asks, like, uh, how much did you get and how much was the topper, as if the difference between the topper and the child is the, that gap will determine what the child is going to do. This whole system of assessment has to change. It is mentioned in the policy. And because of the pandemic, it has expedited the change. Similarly, the digital form of education, I won't say it will be totally digital, it will be a blended mode. Right now, much of the education in both school and higher education is through the, digit, through the online digital mode. But ultimately, some sort of, uh, you know, it's not only learning from the teachers or from the books, the interactions which, uh, which are there in the peer group is equally important. Right now, due to pandemic, it is very difficult. Slowly, the schools are opening up. But this is also important as to uh, the development of a child takes place along with the peers, the interaction which one child has with others. That cannot be through the online mode alone. It has to be in a group, in a playground, in, in, uh, in a classroom situation. Even at the higher education level, the group projects, of course, it can be done through online, but the group discussion can also be held online. But of course, there are many activities where offline is also required. That, due to pandemic, will be uh, a little, uh, it will take a little time before it starts. But the changes in assessment, changes uh, induced by technology, in fact, they have been expedited due to the pandemic. And it's a good change. Uh, so, what about the other aspects of the policy? You mentioned that uh, all proposals with regard to technology, uh, their implementation has been uh, expedited. But there are, of course, other aspects of the policy for which uh, you would maybe need physical presence. For instance, you will have to train teachers for that. So, have you all tried to kind of, uh, uh, have you all reworked, recalibrated your moves and plans to kind of, uh, fit the current situation and scenario, given that this will continue for a bit? The reorientation of teachers, both uh, at, at, in different institutions, be it school or higher, is through the online method. It has, in fact, it started before the pandemic. It was, uh, the NISHTA program was launched before the pandemic in the school sector. And after pandemic, uh, it has been expedited at various levels. How do you train the teachers. Similarly, for the faculty at the higher education level, the online courses, the SWAM portal, MOOCs, they were there even earlier, but now it has been expedited. Some requirement in terms of, uh, uh, say, the language and culture, which is, uh, I mean, which, which has to be experienced, which cannot be only through the online method, that is something which will require more time. So speaking of online education, uh, very recently we had a survey on school education, which, which showed this was a survey uh, which was done, uh, led by economist John Reyes, uh, Ritika Kera, who's a professor in Italy, and a few other researchers. It was supervised by them. This was a survey of 1,400 households. Uh, mostly of underprivileged families. And the survey showed that, you know, just about a quarter of the kids in urban areas and about 8% of the kids in rural areas have access, regular access to education through the online mode. So while it's true that, you know, uh, I guess we have much larger numbers of students who are accessing education through online, through the online mode, the fact is that there, there, is, there is a sizable chunk that is uh, still not be able to uh, uh, attend school regularly. And, and because of that, uh, learning levels have dipped. So we haven't really heard anything from the government on, and uh, as we implement the new education policy, we haven't heard anything uh, from the government on what is being done 
to undo this damage we have lost about one and a half uh, years of education as far as school education is concerned there is more or less a lot of continuity as far as higher education is concerned um, also because of the age group that it caters to but what is it that the government is doing to undo the damage that has been inflicted because of school closures which obviously happened because of the covid-19 pandemic because that would be very important as opposed to implementing something absolutely new given that we have kind of moved further down as far as uh, learning levels are concerned you know sometimes when we think of online education or that let me use the word digital education we immediately start thinking in terms of internet internet is one of the media but there is another which is which we call as swayam prabha there are 34 educational channels and there is a third one which is the radio now one will have to devise an optimum mix of all the media now there are areas in the country it is true that there are difficult areas where internet is not available continuously but those areas are served by the satellite tv so in fact last year itself we had done that 12 channels were allotted specifically to the schools and one channel per class was introduced similarly the all india radio is also giving time to the states to have their educational programs on the radio because some places may not be having access even to a television but uh, the radio and in fact now fm radio can be heard even on the android mobiles so they can be utilized we should not uh, focus only on one medium that is the internet it is of course internet is more helpful it is more interactive but there are other media also including tv and radio if we have a mix of all three depending on the geographical location and uh, uh, the the uh, income group that we are catering to that would be the ideal thing and it has already started as i said that 12 channels have been dedicated to the schools out of the total uh, 34 channels that we operate so that has been a big change similarly radio is, has also come forward with its program so anything with regard to uh, i mean of course through this medium one can continue education anything with regard to bridging the gap that has been created for students who have been left behind for students who possibly have i don't know forgotten uh, their reading skills aren't as strong as they used to be in fact the nipun bharat program that i mentioned the, the focus on uh, literacy and numeracy so even before the pandemic there was a concern that the learning levels in our schools were low mm. so i mean various surveys uh, for even the asar survey used to mention which is the official survey done by the ncert even the uh, surveys by ncert asar sir reports and uh, reports by pratham they used to mention about the low level of learning so this foundation literacy and numeracy this will uh, really help in improving those uh, skills not only amongst those who are already in school in some class but also those who are out of school they can take help of those programs and through the nius or some bridging method they can come back to schools so in fact the system that we have devised for the higher education in form of academic bank of credit another uh, system which has been launched recently by the prime minister the india the architecture which is for the digital uh, learning system so even those who are so called drop out i mean i'm not uh, i don't like using that term drop out because uh, they are the children who are out of the formal education you know drop out means as if uh, uh, there is some sort of uh, insinuation against the child in fact the insinuation is against the system not against the child they are out of uh, the educational system now they can be brought back through this uh, academic bank of credit in the school side which is the ndr which has been uh, thought of so it can bring back the children to the educational system with their whatever they have learned their prior learning can be recognized 
and then they can proceed further even either for skilling or for uh, their higher secondary or uh, even the higher education. Uh, so I would like to move on. I have a couple of more questions. And before I move on to audience questions, uh, you'll have to bear with me for a few more minutes. I have this question, um, of course, dealing with implementation, a very op important aspect of it is financial resources. The document itself talks about providing adequate, in fact, it emphasizes on providing adequate financial uh, support for implementing the proposals made in the new education policy. However, what we saw was in the union budget this year, just in the first year itself, a year where, as I mentioned, that the COVID-19 pandemic has exacerbated um, school dropouts and has affected learning levels. The budget for uh, uh, education has suffered a cut. School education, if I'm not wrong, has kind of taken a deeper cut of about 5,000 crore. And higher education has taken a cut of about 1,000 crore. I hope my figures are right on that. And uh, we wanted to understand that how is the government or how does the government expect to implement uh, an ambitious policy like this without investing adequate financial resources? It's bad enough that there is a lot of disruption that has been caused in the sector because of the pandemic. But you also have a lot, you have a lot on your plate as far as implementation is concerned. So, a, I mean, my first question is your comment with regard to the criticism that is coming your way uh, uh, for the budget cuts that your ministry has suffered uh, in the first year of implementation of the end. There are two parts to it. One is the budget and the other is the resources. I, I, I mean, with my experience of the last uh, three decades, I can say the two are not same. Many a times we allocate money and the actual uh, work or the actual output is much less, not because it is wasted, but because the synergy is not there. Okay. So to give a small example, we spend about 1500 crores, all the states and center and schools and higher education. We spend about 1500 crores a year on technology. Now, technology is neutral to, I mean, it's a neutral to the class or the grade in which the student is studying. The same, say, TV channel can be used even for uh, higher education or for engineering or for uh, school or even for a cultural program. So this distinction that we have made ourselves within the government of different departments and within departments of different sectors and subsectors. If you bring synergy amongst them, the same resources can be better utilized. One example which I gave was of the use of technology, where the platform, the same platform, can be used by multiple agencies. You take the form of our educational institutions, I mean, by and large, they work for about seven or eight hours in a day. Now, the infrastructure, I'm not talking about the faculty, of course, they have to, or the school teachers, they have to work for their, uh, uh, say, preparing the course for the next day. They have to do the evaluation and the assessment of the students. All that work is there. But the infrastructure can be better utilized because the same infrastructure may not be for the purpose of, say, higher education or school education, but a school can be utilized in the evening for skilling. Now, this type of resource pooling will actually have more value for money. I'm not saying that money is not required. The budgets are required. But it can be better used by having more synergy amongst various ministries and states and uh, central government, private sector so that it is better utilized and we get more value for whatever is being spent. For the higher education, I can just explain that the budget was reduced primarily because some of the capital work which were going on for various societies are actually in the completion phase. So the amounts which were, I mean, this is, when we talk of cut, it is actually with reference to the previous years. The the because of the phasing of the projects, and they are now almost all in the completion phase. So there has been a reduction, but I'm not saying that 
more funds are not required funds are required but more than the funds what is required is the the approach in utilizing those resources and in having better utilization through synergy amongst various stakeholders i won't say governments it can be non government also there could be a private partner offering a a training service provider having a vocational course in a school even that is uh, i think a welcome step the policy is very clear that we will welcome uh, the private initiatives provided there is no commercialization that is the i mean that is very clear that commercialization or profiteering is not to be allowed but otherwise those people can also come and be a part of the new system so uh, you mentioned uh, welcoming private initiatives could you for our audience elaborate i mean on, on that point as in you said that they are welcome but not for profiteering how is it that they can participate so they can participate right from setting up of the institution to setting up of the facility in in any sector they can participate the word commercialization is uh, as you would recall the order of the honorable supreme court that the reasonable surplus is to be reinvested so reasonable surplus and for example the fee committees are there in various states to have an upper cap of the fee so profiteering is not there but a reasonable surplus because any institution to survive will require a reasonable surplus and that is what is happening in fact in the higher education side a good number of uh, institutions are actually in the private sector and they are also of good quality uh so you you said that at least i'm presuming uh, what i gather from your answer that maybe possibly for this year as far as higher education is concerned maybe you could make do with the existing resources if they are better utilized as you mentioned through synergy but would you agree that going forward in order to implement this policy effectively you would need more money and the government would have to allocate more money to education because honestly for a lot of people at least i'm education in sector the the budget cut uh, was it kind of sent out the message that maybe you know the government wasn't that serious about implementing uh, any i mean that that was a message that that is how it was perceived no that is the wrong perception as i said many times we associate budgets with the priority so even if the budget is there and it is spent more on uh, say civil works then it is actually not education we have i mean it is spending money on building on uh, building construction rather than on the real education okay so then one more point i would i mean since you are discussing i would mention school education yes they would definitely require funds higher education i may just mention that there is also a provision for the national research foundation which is a work in progress uh, the various approvals have been taken by the scientific uh, advisor to the prime minister and that major funding for research will now be through the nrf so while you may not see that amount in the budget of the higher education that funds will of course flow to the universities and it will be a dedicated fund for research and research does not mean only scientific research it will also include social science so this is a work in progress uh, it has been announced by the finance minister during uh, this year's budget and uh, it is now in the final stages so another question as far as resources are concerned human resource itself again very crucial to implementing the policy uh i mean this i i if, and of course as a personal opinion you know sort of i feel it's, it's like the achilles heel for this government where appointments if you don't have the people at the top in place it would be difficult to execute uh, the proposals in the policy document very recently the higher education ministry did appoint uh, vice chancellors in 12 central universities but even after that there are central universities if i'm not wrong maybe around 10 uh, which still don't have vice chancellors there are iits which don't have chairpersons um 
if we talk about school education, a body like the NCRT, which is again very crucial to curriculum reform and again will have a very big role to play in executing the NEP that has been headless for about a year. Uh, your comment on that, I mean, you know, aside from finances, having the people in place to get the job done and, and, and a, lot of the, a lot of these positions are lying vacant with acting heads. And of course, you can't expect them to implement this policy as seriously, say, as a full-time head could. I mean, if we go on the factual side, some more, uh, I mean, the vice chancellors and directors appointment, some more are coming, uh, hopefully, this week itself. Okay. So, so, but I am more concerned about the faculty shortages. Okay. You know, the, the overall shortage of faculty is about 30%. Right. In the higher education sector. Yes, I would have come There are that. shortages uh, in the school side also, of course, not to that extent. Hmm. But uh, school side, the shortages are because the number of teachers are there, but in the schools, the teachers are language specific, region specific, subject specific. Hmm. So you can't have a Hindi teacher in, say, North India, in a North Indian state. And if the vacancy is of, say, mathematics, so it cannot be filled by you know, shifting a teacher from, say, Hindi to mathematics. So it is subject-wise, it is also because of their uh, uh, state requirements, they have to be, I mean, it is state-wise, language-wise, subject-wise. So those requirements are there. Faculty shortage, I'm more concerned because it takes a long time. You know, making an administrative appointment is a procedural issue which which can be done, I mean, which can be expedited by having, uh, in fact, we have already started most of the interactions that we have for the higher positions of vice chancellors and directors. You know, earlier the delays were because they were all physical. Now we have the interactions over Skype. So, but, but that is a procedural thing. Faculty development requires at least five to ten years. Now, until unless somebody enters uh, the research institution and does the PhD and then works as an assistant professor, only then, say, in the year 2047, we'll have a pool of good researchers who will be professors, say, 20 years down the line, 25 years down the line. So, faculty shortage is something which we are trying to address. On a, in fact, the minister has already ordered that drive should be there in all the central institutions because if we fill up those vacancies today, only then over a period of 20 years, we will have the requisite uh, faculty at the senior level, say the professors or the decision-making level. And that is some area where uh, we need to gear up more. Right. So two quick questions about... Uh two attempts which were made by the ministry or autonomous organizations with the ministry uh, to implement uh, certain provisions of the policy and uh, were controversial. The first I wanted to talk to you about, I mean, multilingualism is, is something that has been emphasized in the policy document. Prime Minister Narendra Modi has also mentioned it quite often in all his speeches with regard to the uh, new education policy. The AICT, uh, to begin with, has allowed, if I'm not wrong, about, uh, I think either 11 or 14, I'm sorry, forget 14, the exact number, 14, 14, 14, 14 institutions, colleges, yes. right, to offer certain programs, engineering programs in five languages. That's, of course, the start. But this conversation, especially about introducing other languages in higher education, last year started around October, November with the IITs and the IIMs where there were meetings held. And uh, of course, I, I'm, I'm presuming that was done with the intention that uh, it maybe would be easier for these institutions to do it and would send across the right message. But but that is what that was the announcement in a way that we are going to start this with the IITs and IIMs. And after that, we didn't hear anything about it. What exactly happened to getting the IITs and IIMs? We know that there was internally possibly a fair bit of resistance to this idea. But where do we stand as far as... Um, getting the IITs, IIMs, NITs for that matter, all INIs to implement uh, the multilingualism aspect of the policy? You know, one thing we should be very clear 
what the Prime Minister has also mentioned in his uh, address earlier, that nobody is against English. Hmm. So it is not that English is to be replaced by some other language. It is to ensure, I mean, what we want is to ensure that language should not become a barrier to the talent. In fact, uh, uh, it's almost 40 years, 40 years plus, when I joined IIM Ahmedabad, and uh, there were a few students who were not good at English, and there was a course for them, the bridge course, so that they could make up. Because what we should be looking at in the system is for the talent. The knowledge of subject is more important than the knowledge of language, which is just a medium of communication. Who knows uh, another 20, 30 years down the line, the entire medium of communication may be through some computer program or could be a mind reader from your side to mine. And uh, the whole concept of different languages may not be there. So the importance is to ensure that those who are not talent, those who are talented but not proficient in English, who are otherwise talented, they should not miss an opportunity. In fact, many of the dropouts who happen or people who leave the courses in the first year of these institutions, they are finding it difficult to understand the courses in English. So they are, that is the place where we wish to have this intervention. And uh, the IIT, in fact, uh, one of the IITs has informed me that uh, after their JE advance, they will be bringing the online courses in the regional languages. So what happens is that in the classroom, the discussion could be in English, but the same thing could be understood a little later by the student in some other regional language or the Indian language. So which IIT now, could that be? Sorry, sorry to interrupt. We'll, we'll let you know. That announcement will come. Right. Now, the important point is that there is no language specific seat allocation. You know, there was a misunderstanding that there will be language specific seat allocation in different uh, institutions. Certainly not. There is no such provision in the constitution. We are not going to have it. And that is not the purpose of it. The purpose is to ensure that the students who are otherwise talented should not get deprived because they are not proficient in English, especially students who come from the rural background. They study, many of them study up to class 10 or even up to 12 in their uh, regional languages. They should not feel deprived because of the English language. That is the main purpose. And so how far along has the government been able to like you mentioned, case of one IIT, which may introduce uh, their online program. IIT, one NIT has already started that NIT at Patna will be having courses in in dual language. So they will be having English plus Hindi. The this textbooks are, yes, NIT Patna is having the courses in English and Hindi. And this From would be again online, sir? I mean, for Patna as well? No, because after all, the in the class, the teaching has to be in one language. But otherwise, outside the class, they can take the help of their online courses. So uh, I would come to the second uh, uh, attempt, which was, again, it was made, AICT uh, had tweaked the entry qualification for engineering, uh, which said that um, you would not, you, should, you shouldn't have necessarily studied uh, physics, maths, chemistry in class 12. Uh, and the institutions had the autonomy to take in students without PCM in class 12, provided they could provide a, a bridge course once these students joined to kind of help them bring them up to speed with the rest of the class. This uh, proposal uh, came in for a lot of criticism, especially by subject experts, Mr. V.K. Saraswat, who is a member of Niti Aayog, also expressed strong reservations about it. Principal Scientific Advice expressed reservations about it. What, we are, what I wanted to understand is, uh, A, of course, this was done by an autonomous organization. Was the government take was in the loop before this announcement was made? And what is the government's stand on that, given that 
reservations and strong reservations have been expressed by people within the government as well. No, firstly, as a matter of policy, we do not interfere in the academic discussions. The academic decisions, because we are not the experts, whether the secretary or the joint secretary, I mean, we are academic administrators, we are not the academician. There is a great difference between the two. I mean, although I have spent more than two decades in this field, including this ministry for more than 10 years, but I still continue to be an academic administrator. So the academic decisions are to be taken by the UGC or AICT or the universities. But an important point here is that, as I said earlier, one size fit all will not work. So all the courses, there are certain courses where we do require physics, chemistry, maths. By and large, most of the courses are like that. But there could be some exceptions where the knowledge of these aspects, for example, if there is a course on design, if there is a course on packaging, a packaging technology may not require the type of rigor in mathematics which is required for, say, mechanical engineering. Now, that is the fine-tuning or calibration which the AICT will have to do that if at all the students are to be allowed, that will be in a specific discipline. It cannot be for any discipline. Because there's a spectrum, I mean, what we call as engineering. Within engineering, there are so many different branches. And there are so many specializations. There could be a few specializations which can allow this entry without uh, having a background of mathematics or chemistry. But they are limited. And therefore, the rule has to be made in a way that it is meant only for those limitations. In fact, I was in a meeting where you mentioned Dr. Saraswat. And the issue is that it should not be misused. I mean, that is the apprehension of the scientific community that a provision which is made for an exceptional situation should not be misused in a general circumstances, say, all entry to civil and mechanical engineering will be without knowledge of, uh, say, physics and uh, mathematics, that will be a very difficult and a very wrong situation. So it has to be calibrated. It has to be very specific only for those disciplines which actually do not require so much knowledge of, uh, uh, say, uh, mathematics or chemistry, but they may be requiring knowledge of engineering drawing. So that sort of combination can be allowed. Right. So uh, we'll move on to the audience questions. Um, we'll start with uh, uh, Aditya from uh, APJ Education. A uh, very good evening, sir. Uh, always a pleasure to uh, hear you speak. Uh, so one big question for us. I mean, is we are we are coming on the anniversary uh, of the uh, the the wonderful NEP, which is. I think we've been at least waiting for three to four decades for, for this sort of revolutionary policy to come in. Uh, there's, there's an estimate that to fully implement it, even at the central level, there will be at least uh, uh, changes required to eight to 10 different acts uh, in the central government. Now, of course, the government has had to prioritize COVID for the past one year. Is there a timeline that the government has in the next uh, six months, one year, two years, to, uh, 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 to formally amend all those acts that need to be amended to fully enable the NEP, both in terms of those acts that correspond to education, such as the UGC, ICT Act, but then also some of the others, such as you know the company's law, society's law, uh, and, and such, to bring those uh, principles uh, to actual uh, bear. Uh, thank you, Mr. Raditya. In fact, uh, this... Uh, Amendments will should have come this year, but for the difficult situation that we are having, hopefully by next year, some of these amendments will be a part of the Higher Education Commission. Why it is taking time, I'll explain. That the government has continuously been in the consultative mode, even when the policy was formed. 
it took uh, i mean many people do mention that it took a long time because uh, you would recall that more than 2 lakh suggestions were received from different sources similarly the higher education commission instead of i mean we have a draft with us but instead of going before the union cabinet or to the parliament we have decided that after the draft is i mean there have been some discussions within the ministry and ugc aict but we would rather prefer to have a wider consultation with the state governments and with the stakeholders and because this will be an act not only for central institutions but and the state government institutions but also for private institutions so it is only after the consultation that we would like to go uh, to the parliament with our bill so that is why it is something which is likely in the year 2022 right um can like azam ask a question is like there shall i move on to the next all right one second yes is hello right sorry go ahead yeah sir uh, hello sir my okay. question is a little different it is regarding the philosophy and idea behind our uh, new education policy sir the children are known for innocence and curiosity uh, innocence can be nurtured in children to develop the virtues of sensitivity and morality uh, similarly a uh, curiosity can be nurtured to develop the spirit of innovation and creativity the said virtues and spirits are considered as very important to achieve an equitable inclusive and plural society which is also the ultimate objective of our new education policy uh, sir please share some thoughts and research or some ideas if we could nurture these innocence and curiosity of children in achieving the goal of our new national education policy so do we do we have any study regarding this thank you mr azam in fact uh, this is something which the prime minister himself mentioned during uh, one of the discussions when the policy was being made that many a time our children will be curious to know i mean say a young child will be curious to know how a water tank works say the what we call in india as pani tanki so there is a motor there is a water source the motor pushes the water upwards it is stored and then distributed now it's a very small i mean to to an adult like us it may sound a very uh, perfunctory type of a thing that there is a water tank and what is so great about it look at it from the eyes of a children a child who is say 4 years old there is a lot of curiosity how the train moves on a railway line how a plane takes a flight now there are so many articles around us which can actually lead to curiosity amongst the children even uh, say music composer how does music come out uh, of a of an instrument now this is possible and that is why the first few years dr kasturi rangan who was actually the architect who drafted the commit the, the the national education policy he had done a great deal of research on the development of neurons he consulted the eminent people from nimhans and others and the whole idea is that at the early age through various types of activities and those activities are not costly activities they are all around us the child should be encouraged to explore and learn for herself for himself and that is what has been their activity based remove the classroom type abc ka kha ga try to help the child learn from the peers learn from the surroundings learn from the experience and that is what is there in the first two years the 5 plus 3 plus 3 plus 4 system in fact the f- three years of uh, uh, the the first five years are more or less this joyful learning without any baggage um heman bhagwat can you please ask your question 
Uh, yes, good evening. Am I audible? Yes, you are. Go ahead. Thank you. Sir, if I may say so, education is a highly politicized subject in our country with ideology playing a huge role at all levels. Uh, syllabus formation or its revision can be cited as an example. This ideological dimension will directly or indirectly impact the execution of NEP at all stages. Sir, quite a few good government schemes get grounded at execution stage. The NEP aims to bring fundamental changes in our education field, and the change is going to take a lot of time. It will require, in my opinion, a robust monitoring and course correcting mechanism, say like the GST Council, to continuously monitor its implementation to ensure that the objectives of NAP are getting achieved. What do you think? What are these measures that need to be in place and uh, effective for the NEP to succeed? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bhagwat. Now, firstly, the policy is child-centric. Give opportunity to the child, give the choice to the child. Let us ensure that every child develops her or his talent. Politics is not there in the policy. And that is why, one reason why during the last one year, when, when we were drafting the policy, there were so many apprehensions that it may lead to agitations, protests. But by and large, the policy has been well accepted because it is focusing on the child and the future of this country. No government, no party, no uh, organization is going to say that don't give choice to the child to study this or that. I think that is the basic strength of this policy that we are trying to empower the students, the youth, the future of our country and where there will be no two voices that they should not be empowered. Now having said that, there are the, the problem occurs when we try to impose something on others. The policy is to that extent flexible also that we are not trying to impose, let us say, the textbook of uh, one state or one, uh, let us say, NCRT to everybody. It is not there in the policy. So while the policy moves in a certain direction, all of us, be it the states or the private stakeholders or the parents, all of them are stakeholders. They have to move in a certain direction. But the pace at which the movement will be there and the way in which the movement will be there is actually not uh, imposed by the policy. The policy does not impose that within five years, this has to be done by all stakeholders within three years. Everybody must do this. So that is the type of flexibility which the policy offers within a broader framework that we must have. I mean, if I could put the policy in one sentence, citizens who are well-rooted in Indian values, and I'm using the word India. It is not a particular language or a particular region. We want good citizens who are rooted in India, but who have a global outlook. And I don't think there will be any doubt from any quarter about this uh, intention that we have. Uh, can Mr. Karan Trehan ask his question, please? Hi, good evening. I'm audible? Yes, ah, please. So, uh, first of all, congratulations for a very progressive uh, policy. Uh, I think it's, it's fairly progressive and forward-looking. Uh, my question is coming from what you mentioned that the first six years, the first five years of the child is one of the most important years. Unfortunately, in our country, that segment of education has been kind of orphaned for a very long time. Um, and then and it's it's great that you've included the next two years as part and made it made it for the, for the first five years. My uh, my uh, my questions are two prong two points. So one, what are the um, checklists which are there in place to make sure that the quality is delivered when it comes to early childhood education, the first five years, foundational years. And my second question is, uh, there's, a, there's a little ambiguity rega regarding under which ministry would 
these first five years fall into? Because currently, if I understand clearly, it comes under Women and Child Development Ministry. And now, since we've added another two years to the entire segment, so would it be under the Education Ministry or Women and Child Development Ministry or both the ministries would be overseeing this particular very important segment of the child's years? When your question is in two parts. One is about the administrative control and the other is about the type of curriculum. Now, what we have, uh, the policy has envisaged and uh, what we have done is that the administratively, the, there are two ministries. One is of the education, the Department of School Education. The other is Women and Child. Because you would appreciate that the Anganwadis or the play schools, they also serve a different purpose, that they are the centers which provide nutrition to the child and also to the mothers. So having said that, the administrative control is one part. The other, which is more important part, is what is the type of education which is being imparted there. And that education has to be within a new curricula. In fact, uh, this is a work, the broad outlines have been framed by NCERT. They are, there is already an early childhood type of a curriculum. It will be more play based. But the important point is that the development of a child, the movement of a child in the first five years, the, it should not be determined by the type of governance and the administration that this is Anganwadi under this ministry and this is a school. I mean, if we take the child, the five years, that is three plus, I mean, if there is a three-year-old child, so from the age three to eight, there's one continuum from the view of the child. And that is what the policy and Dr. Kasturi Rangan have emphasized, that the center of our object, the, the central point of our policy is that child. It's not the ministry. I mean, ministries could be different. There will be, there are many places where there will be no ministry. I mean, it could be a private initiative. So taking the child as the central point, develop that uh, play type of a curricula so that there is a continuous growth of the neurons of the child. And the child tries to explore his or her talent, could be in sports, could be in uh, uh, music, could be in dance, or could be in all of them, could be an all-rounder also. And let the child develop and learn, and then there will be the benchmarks of minimum level of learning. So instead of the hours of teaching, in fact, that is the big change that we are having in this policy, that by and large our systems focus on the inputs, how many hours, and the credits are also decided based on the inputs, that these many hours. What we are now focusing is the output, what is the minimum level of learning, has the child attained that, how many, what is the percentage of child, children who are able to read and write up to this level. So this is the basic, basic change which is occurring. And uh, the focus being on the child and the development of the child in the early years, I think that will be a major uh, transformation even for the subsequent years when the same child moves to the secondary school or to the skill center or to higher education. This will be a major change. So, and administratively, who would be looking after it? So, administratively, the uh, the organization which is already having the uh, Anganwadi or the school, because if the there are many places where the Anganwadis are actually in the schools, there are others where they are totally separate. Now, this point was debated when the policy was being formulated, and that is another example how the states have been given freedom. Because many states said that we have a some of the states already have this type of a continuum. Some other states, uh, they said that uh, they have a separate system altogether between schools and Anganwadis. They are not even co-located. So that freedom has been given to the states. Who, while the administrative arrangements can differ from state to state, the broad understanding or the ECC curriculum, the EC curriculum would continue to be the same. Uh, Shupul Bansal. Uh, am I audible? 
yes uh thank you uh my question is which government body would make sure that the new changes are being implemented and the teachers are being trained properly under the new system and the second question is how would the schools and colleges be made accountable so the so that the entire burden of trial and error of this new system is not being put on the students thank you thank you madam bansal i'll start with the your second question about the uh, control on the schools and colleges now we are moving to a system of self disclosure but with strong regulations to ensure that there are no false disclosures now given the size of the system as i said there are 1043 universities there are about 45000 colleges and if you take the number of schools another 15 lakh schools are there so instead of having a monitor type of a system that either the central government or state government or the local governments they start acting like a monitor the better system is that a self discipline given the overall parameters let the institutions make their own disclosures which should be in public domain it was not possible a few years earlier because the technology was not there now given the technology i mean i can just add that uh, a few years ago all the engineering colleges they were physically inspected by the aict now since last year everything has been shifted to an online system without any interface nobody has to approach the office and through the google maps and uh, the photographs and geotagging etc all the information and uh, is not only available it is verified so the whole system will move to a self disclosure based if i am a teacher i will disclose what is my qualification what is uh, what type of training i have received where exactly i am teaching the institution will disclose what type of courses or the students they are having and therefore this system will be much better than the inspector type of a system that we have firstly in a large system which is going to expand even further the inspector system will not work and secondly you know the problems which an inspector raj brings about the first question that the body to monitor now this is a collaborative exercise so it is not so much of imposing that as per act so and so the state government should have done this or the institution or a private university should have done that it is more of a collaborative exercise where we take everybody along to move in the direction of a new india i think that is the the basic idea that you take everybody along and uh, we i mean when we talk of uh, uh, say monitoring we start thinking in terms of governments but uh, let me just say that uh, in higher education every big role is played by the private sector even in the schooling you know a good number of enrollment is now in the private side in the skill sector again the private initiative is there so we have to take everybody along it's not only government central government state government local government private stakeholders even philanthropists so many of our alumni from iits and nits now they are coming back and they are contributing to their own institution also to the schools where they had studied they are trying to mentor the students so all that is uh, there and we have to take everybody along instead of imposing governance structures from outside uh, we're running out of time so we'll just take one more question from the audience anviti rai yeah good evening am i audible go ahead please yeah um so as ms ritika mentioned the emergency report in that emergency report it was reported that the schooling system has absolutely failed the underprivileged students as a combination of factors led to a recipe for disaster and in a country where uh, a section of the population does not even have access to basic needs it cannot be expected that the online education model can be successful now as you mentioned sir um there are other measures which have been implemented like 
टी वी प्रोग्राम्स एंड रेडियो प्रोग्राम्स एंड एवरीथिंग बट दिस रिपोर्ट ऑल्सो टच इज ऑन द फैक्ट दैट ओनली वन परसेंट ऑफ रूरल चिल्ड्रन एंड एट परसेंट ऑफ अर्बन चिल्ड्रन एक्नोलेज टी वी एज इवन अ मीडियम फॉर स्टडी माई क्वेश्चन इज दैट एज द स्कूल्स आर सेट टू रीओपन वॉट इज बींग डन बाय द गवर्नमेंट टू इंश्योर दैट दीज स्टूडेंट्स आर कॉट अप टू पार सींग दैट दे को नॉट स्टडी रेगुलरली ऑनलाइन एंड हैव बीन प्रमोटेड टू हायर ग्रेड डिस्पाइट नॉट इवन बींग एबल टू रीड मोर देन अफ यूट पर्सन एज द स्कूल्स रीओपन एंड एज आई सेट नॉट ओनली दो आर विद इन द स्कूल्स that is those who are in the schooling system those who are outside the system and as i said earlier i don't wish to use the word drop out because it has a sort of demeaning connotation the these those who are in that cohort they through they are to be brought back to the system through a bridge course and that bridging is possible today by various uh, courses of nios by having the bridging system at different levels even earlier the system of bridge courses was there but it will be required on a much larger scale to bridge this gap not only for those who were in school and who could not attend because of pandemic but also for those who have dropped out altogether uh so i would like to ask uh, the last two questions one of course is a uh, so our comment section is practically been hijacked i think it possibly a lot of our viewers uh so this is unrelated to the nep we asked one question which is unrelated which is that a lot of the tkip me- uh, faculty which of course uh they have they they've been seeking answers they want to understand whether uh the government would uh do something to ensure that they continue beyond their contract period which i believe ends in a few weeks it tekup in fact uh, completed its tenure it was a tenure project it completed the tenure on 31st march right 2021 so we got it extended by 6 months right it's a world bank supported project and as of now the further support of world bank is not there on the positive side i can say that we have made request to the various state government because they do have the faculty shortages and they they are already working there so the minister has already written to the chief ministers i have written to the chief secretaries some of the states have already resolved a good example being bihar they have already resolved that they will take them as their faculty so that is uh, the way forward that where the faculty uh, vacancies are there some of them could get absorbed there of course we have uh, also formulated a new world bank aided project but it is likely to take more time if uh, because the the world bank has its own approval processes so it is likely to take more time this is the situation as of now so when did the minister and, and you said you also wrote to the states when when did that happen in last month the and you the minister has written right and you're saying that out of them as of now only bihar has sort of responded bihar has them. bihar has already because we had written to them earlier also bihar has issued a government resolution that they will be taking their services so what happens to the rest sir in that case say if the states do not get absorbed do the i mean the world bank funded project it was clear that they are for the project duration okay so it was clear in the contract itself but still we as i said the government has been considerate and first the extension was given for 6 months from 31st march to 30th september and now the effort is on to see if they could be accommodated in some of the states so last question what is it that we're going to see you you've given us a recap of what has been achieved uh you sort of have an idea of the work in progress as far as other uh, other uh, provisions of the policy are concerned what do you think that we may see uh may see happening in the next 6 months if not 6 months the next one year as far as the uh implementation of the policy is concerned what do you think may happen immediately in the near future or maybe in the next one year 
you know, in the short term, the university courses will become more embedded with internship. It is very clear the UGC has already passed the resolution that internship-based courses will be there so that the graduates who come out of our universities, they are more uh, job-oriented. Those who wish to go for research, fine, they will go for four-year courses and research. But say, after doing BCom, if a person is not able to get a proper employment, this internship-based course will help her or him. Similarly, if somebody is doing a course in the university, a, a, an apprenticeship-based course on, say, retail or insurance, so these are the new sectors which are emerging. And this will be a big change of employability that uh, the university education will be education plus. So some sort of a internship-based skilling will also be there. This is a change which has already been approved by the UGC uh, full commission meeting. And it will be there in this year itself in the academic uh, circles. Some other change uh, which uh, will be there is, uh, as I said, the convergence of all the technologies from the school up to the higher education and skill development so that there would be one platform. A child need not approach uh, various platforms. I mean, right now, there are so many names of so many schemes. Sometimes even the officials get confused. So there will be one platform under the umbrella of uh, National Education Technology Forum so that there is synergy amongst the technologies. A major change would also be there in the assessment. In fact, there is a uh, approval of the government regarding school assessments. And, uh, you know, one exam make or break type of a situation will not be there. So the assessment system will also undergo a change this year itself. So that from next year, you know, this whole question whether we should have a class 12 exam or we should not have a class 12 exam, this type of situation arose because the assessment systems are still the very old systems of, you know, in our parents' time, we used to call them metric and intermediate. And the same type of systems are continuing. In fact, this 10 plus 2 is continuing since the year 1978. Now the time has come to change the systems of assessment. So this will also be a big change which will be there in this year. Great. Uh, thank you so much for joining us for this explaining session, sir. We appreciate your patience. You've taken all our questions. Uh, I would apologize to a couple of audience members who could not, we couldn't, uh, I mean, for the paucity of time, they couldn't ask their questions. And uh, uh, Monojit will, uh, just over to you, Monojit, for a quick vote of thanks. Monoji, are you there? Okay, I, I think there is some, I believe there's some technical difficulty. Um, I'll take over. So thank you again. Uh, thank you to, you to our audience for joining us. And uh, we would also like to thank our partners, uh, uh, Plutus IAS and um, uh, APJ Education. Uh, thank you once again, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Plutus I has got highly qualified and experienced faculties. We offer small batch is interactive online classes, doubt sessions, answer writing. Plutus IS starting online and offline batches for the year of 2022, 2023 and 2024. Plutus IS got highly qualified and experienced faculties. We offer small batches, interactive online classes, doubt sessions, answer writing sessions, mock tests, mock interviews. For registration, go to our website plutusis.com or call 844-844-0231.